Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Book 4 of St. Augustine's Confessions, one of the topics to which he devotes a number of chapters is the death of a close friend and the grief that he feels over it. And he is doing some biographical narration. This is what happened. This is what I felt. But it's also a very deep and probing meditation on the nature of love, friendship, grief, what would actually help to deal with these matters and a connection to God that he's offering to us, the reader, and he's also monologuing with God about. He is reflecting on his own life. And we've got an older Augustine looking back at younger Augustine, trying to figure these things out on his own and not actually having all of the resources or insights or ideas that he would need in order to make sense of this. So the, the story runs along these lines. This is in chapter four. He says, during those years when I first began to teach, it was in the town in which I was born, I gained a friend, my equal in age, flowering like me with youth, very dear to me because of community of interests. And now I want to pause here for a moment and say that one of the things that is going on in this set of chapters Augustine is taking what by that time are sort of already traditional and accepted notions of the best kind of friendship that go all the way back to Aristotle and perhaps be beyond. So, the, you know, we're talking about centuries of accumulated ideas uh, about friendship. And he is saying these by themselves are not enough. So there's a community of interests, shared interests. They're of the same age in life. They're living together. He says in childhood, he was not such a friend as he became later on. Um, but I knew him from that time. And so we spent all sorts of time together. I, of course, screwed up by taking him away from the true faith, that is Christianity, towards the Manichaeism that Augustine was, was uh, captivated by at the time. And he says, but it was sweet to us, made fast as it was by our ardor in like pursuits. And so this is a really important part of uh, a traditional understanding of friendship. Later on, he will invoke this metaphor that often gets used for this, this great kind of friendship of the soul into bodies. This is in chapter six. He says that, I marveled that other men should live because he whom I loved as if he would never die was dead. I marveled more that I, his second self, could live when he was dead. Well has someone said of his friend that he is half of his soul, for I thought that my soul and his soul were but one soul in two bodies. Therefore, my life was a horror to me because I would not live as but a Half and this, you know, two souls in one body goes all the way back to Plato's Symposium. Um, you know, Aristotle references it in the Nicomachean Ethics discussion of friendship. This is a commonplace by that time, and it, you know, it corresponds to a, a kind of feeling that we have when we have a very deep, abiding, close love relationship with another person that we are really two parts of a greater whole. We are one soul in two bodies. They are our other half. And so that's part of this as well. Now, is this true friendship? Here's where Augustine is kind of adding something to the picture. No, it's not friendship in the truest sense. It is 
you know, true like friendship, you could say. But what is actually needed? God. So he tells us that a friendship cannot be true unless you join it together among those who cleave to one another. And the word for that is hierentes, which is coming from this uh, uh, Latin word uh, verb, hierin, which uh, means to like cling to, to be connected with, to grip on to. And he, he goes on and he says, those who are cleaving to one another, they have to do so by the charity, caritas, right? Caritate in this. Charity is not simply giving alms to people who need it. It is the word for a great kind of love. And where does this love come from? Here he quotes scripture and he says, poured forth in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. So without that charity, there's always something missing to friendship. That is what really brings it together. And so we have to love you could say in and through God, or else it's not going to be a true friendship. This is something different than a lot of other ancient views on, on friendship. What happens? Well, his friend gets sick with a fever and looks like he's going to die. Already Augustine is getting prepared for this. They baptize the friend, the, the Christian uh, relatives. Augustine thinks, eh, who cares, you know, uh, not, not a big deal. And then the friend revives and the friend is told that he's been baptized. And he and, and Augustine have a kind of confrontation, you could say. Um, he says, I tried to make jokes with him just as though he would joke with me about that baptism. He had learned that he had received it. He was horrified at me as if I were an enemy. And he warned me with a swift and admirable freedom. If I wish to remain his friend, I must stop saying such things to him. What, what things? Manichaean things, right? Augustine was struck dumb and disturbed, but concealed his feelings. He's thinking, ah, this will blow over. And then the friend gets sicker and dies. And now the grief comes. Now the sorrow. And this is you know, proportionate to the love that one feels, this is heart-wrenching sorrow, right? If Augustine had not made himself vulnerable, you could say, by loving, trusting, engaging so deeply with the friend, he could not be so hurt. And he says, my heart was made dark by sorrow, uh, dolore tenebratum, literally shadows, shades, right? And so the sorrow itself makes everything darker. He says that um, everything I looked upon was death. My native place was a torment to me. My father's house, a strange unhappiness. Whatever I had done together with him, my friend, was a cruel torture apart by him. My eyes sought for him on every side and he was not given to them. I hated all things because they no longer held them. And so the absence of the love friend and the presence of everything else, everything else that in some respect, you know, Augustine said, that doesn't deserve to be. Why does he have to die instead of all these other poor slobs over here? This is my friend. Well, this is something that we can encounter and experience when we feel deep grief. The world becomes a different world to the person who is grieving. And this is a big, big problem. Augustine finds himself caught within a, we might say, emotional or psychological and even volitional dynamic where he's befuddled. And he, he talks about this uh, in chapter six. He says, I wept bitterly and I found rest in my bitterness. So wretched was I that I held the life of wretchedness or misery, miseria in Latin, uh, being unhappy. So, so miserable was I that I found the life of miserable to be more dear, more desirable to me than my friend himself. So this is really strange, isn't it? Why would we have a positive attachment to something so 
negative in place of something positive. This is a strange thing that we human beings and apparently many other animals do as well. And then he says, so there's, a, there's sort of a conflict in the will itself. Although I wished or willed to change it, to change this situation, yet I was more unwilling, I, I'm choosing against, nolere in Latin, uh, to lose it than I was to lose my friend. And he says, I do not know whether I would have wished its loss even for his sake, uh, as is told of Orestes and Pilates, two legendary guys who wished to die together for one another, since to them not to live together was worse than death. But in me, there had arisen, I know not what sort of affection, one far different than theirs that most heavily weighed upon me, both weariness of life and fear of dying. He doesn't want to die to rejoin his friend or to like be in oblivion, uh, no longer having to worry about this. This affect, this feeling, this psychological, emotional dynamic of grieving has become something he is attached to now. And he raises all sorts of puzzles and questions about grief and weeping and the viewpoints that we take a little bit earlier in chapter five. Um, as a matter of fact, we should, we should bring this up as well. Augustine, he tells uh, us, becomes a great riddle and the word riddle actually translates the Latin quaestio, a question, a question to himself. He doesn't understand himself. He doesn't understand the feelings that he's having. He doesn't understand his reactions. He says, I questioned my soul as to why it was so sad and why it affected me so grievously. And it could answer me nothing. If I said to my soul, hope in God, well, that's not helpful. He says it did right uh, not to obey me because um, the man, most dear one, who she had lost, my soul was more real and more good to her than the fantasy in which she was made to hope. Because at that time, his understanding of God is a fantasia, is a made-up image. He doesn't actually know God. And, and this is so often the case. This is a bit of a digression. When we go up to people at funerals and we're like, oh, they're in a better place. Oh, God is helping them. You know, we may not know what the hell we're talking about. We may just be mouthing platitudes. And they themselves, this may be totally unconsoling in the same way as it is for Augustine, because if they don't have the right conception of God, how the hell is this going to help anything emotionally. It's not. So he goes on and he says, only weeping was sweet to me. Why? What, what's going on with that? And he says, um, here's some, some questions. Is it that you, God, although present in all places, have flung away our misery far away from yourself and you abide unchanged in yourself while we spin around in our trials? That's one way of looking at it. You know, God is not bothered by the fact that our close loved ones die. God is unchanging. This is just something that affects us human beings. There are people who hold that sort of view. Augustine goes on and he says, you know, if that was the case, then unless we could weep into your ears, no trace of hope would remain for us. Right? So that's not a helpful way of looking at things. Then he approaches another possibility. What, whence is it then, where does this come from, that sweet fruit is plucked from life's bitterness, from mourning and weeping, from sighing and lamentation? Why, why do we come to like this? Why do we want to cry and whine and not do other things and feel bitter and see the world darkened by shadows? He goes on and he says, does sweetness lie there because we hope that you will graciously hear us, God? That holds for our prayers, but does that hold for grief? Is God moved by our, you know, turning into balls of suffering and tears? Is that what God wants from us? Augustine is asking. And he says, you know, uh, I didn't hope that he would come back to life, nor did I beg for that by my tears. I only sorrowed and wept for I was wretched and I had lost my joy. Or here's a, another possibility. 
Is weeping itself a bitter thing? And does it give us pleasure because of distaste for things in which we once took joy, but only at such, such times as we shrink back from them? When we've lost something that was to us a good and a joy, something that we loved, do we choose bitterness instead? Because we can't bear to deal with the joy, the love that we've now lost. Augustine actually says in the next chapter, ah, it's not the time for questioning, but to, to confess to you, God. But he'll go on and you know, talk a little bit more about these matters as well. And we should, we should think about what he says in chapter 7. Right? He calls this a madness on his part. I raged and sighed and wept and became distraught. There was for me neither rest nor reason. I carried about my pierced and bloodied soul, rebellious at being carried by me. I could find no place to put it down. Uh, not in pleasant groves. We're going to come back to this in a moment. Let's think about that. You're, you're in a situation where you feel bad and you can't get away from it. So what can we, in fact, do? Right? Well, we're going to talk about remedies, but there is an insight that Augustine expresses, and this is in uh, chapter 6. He, he tells us that um, one thing that we don't understand is that every soul that is bound fast by friendship for mortal things is wretched, whether it realizes it or not. It's, you could say, potentially wretched. The wretchedness is just around the corner, the misery, the, the, the uh, hurt the grief. Why? Because those things can be lost. As, as he goes on to say, it is miserable uh, and it's torn asunder when it loses them and then first feels the misery by which it is wretched even before it loses these things. So we could say you're, you're, you're miserable, but you don't know it. You actually think you're feeling good. You actually think you're feeling great. You've got this friend that you're loving with, two souls in one body, and then it's gone. They're gone. The life that you had is gone. Like all mortal things, like all created goods, it can be taken from us. So every, what is the corollary to this? Should we just like withdraw from everything? No, no, we, we should love things in the right ways. And he's not going to tell us quite what that is yet. Now, can we fix this? Can we find things to fill in that gap, that hole inside of us? He, he tries to do that. He says, I didn't find uh, peace and happiness in pleasant groves or in games and singing or in sweet scented spots or rich banquets, not in the pleasures of the bedchamber. He's, you know, he's having sex with his concubine uh, already, right? Not in books and poetry to define rest. All things grew loathsome, even the light itself. Whatever was not he, my friend, was base and wearisome to me, all except groans and tears, for in them alone was found a little rest. So all these compensations, all these pleasant things that we could use to distract ourselves from the, the bad feelings that we're feeling, they don't really work. Not in a case like this. What does work is feeling the feelings, but that still feels bad. Right? So you get a little bit of stuff from that. What could, in fact, help? He says, um, to you, O Lord, my soul should have been lifted up to be eased by you. I knew it. This is interesting. I knew it, but I willed it not. It's possible for us to know in a cognitive sense what we ought to do, and yet in a practical, affective sense, a volitional sense, not to actually do it. And he says, I willed it not, nor was I able to will it. Why? Because uh, for me, when I thought on you, you were not something solid and firm. You were not then what you are now. You were just an empty phantom, and error was my God. So when we have all sorts of you could call them wishful thinking ideas about God and, you know, imaginary things. 
Augustine is perfectly happy to say, if your idea is of God is like the cartoon guy in the sky, that ain't going to cut it. That's not going to help you out at all. You can only place these things through a relation to a God that you actually do know, a real God. Lacking that, as Augustine says, having erroneous conceptions, that's not going to help. What else can help? Obviously, if Augustine had to have a correct relationship to God, you know, both intellectually and volitionally, in order to get out of his sorrow, and that was the only way that he could do it, he would still be in his sorrow, you know, a good ways into the, the book. Well, another thing that can help you out is time. We've got this time heals all wounds. That's kind of a BS thing to say, especially to people who are grieving. But there is something to that. He says, time does not take time off, nor does it turn without purpose through our senses. It works wondrous effects in our mind. See how it came and went from day to day. And by coming and going, it planted in me other hopes and other memories. And little by little, they filled me up again with my former sources of delight. My sorrow gave way to them, but... To it succeeded not new sorrows, but yet causes of new sorrows. And so, you know, he's, he's talking about eventually being caught up in other matters. You know, you lose your spouse and for a year it's really bad. And then you find that you, you know, want to tend to the garden that both of you worked on together because it's now the new season and time for planting and you get you know caught up in weeding and things like that and eventually the sorrow doesn't necessarily ever go completely away but it doesn't have the same totalitarian grasp over you as a person that it did before it shares that space with other things and it can emerge again later on uh, you know, my my father died when I was only 11. I still grieve him to today, but it's only once in a while. It's not like the, the grief that I didn't actually allow myself to feel then and then had to work through in my teenage years and 20s. Um, Augustine is telling us that time, it's not that time itself heals all wounds. It's what time is filled by that allows us to have new new memories to latch on to, and new things to pay attention to. So this is a set of very profound meditations spurred by the death of a friend about death and grieving and loss much more generally.